So my name is Wilmore Webley. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Microbiology uh, with special emphasis in bacteriology, uh, mostly studying infectious bacteria and immunology. In other words, what I do is actually look at how hosts uh, interact with bacterial infections that might invade. I have been a professor here at UMass for uh, the past five years. Uh, I did my graduate work here in microbiology as well. Once I got uh, finished with my PhD and got a faculty position, I naturally continued uh, with chlamydia because by then I was very fascinated with this bug that has this amazing biphasic developmental life cycle. It's an obligate intracellular pathogen. What that means is that it lives exclusively within a host cell. Now, a, a human cell is one of the most hostile environments on the planet. So for a bug to feel comfortable enough to live within a human cell, it must have really amazing capabilities. So you could easily have chlamydia and go around with it for years and not know that it is there causing pathological um, changes in your body that eventually are going to lead to stuff like infertility. Uh, that probably going to lead to reactive arthritis, uh, that you probably have some low-level pneumonia that you probably assume is the uh, common cold, but it's actually caused by chlamydia pneumonia. We're re realizing that it is the persistent form of the organism that we're finding in stuff like atherosclerotic plaques, where chlamydia is now uh, being found. Uh, chlamydia has been found in the brains of Alzheimer's disease patients. It's been found in, the, in the, the joints of people with reactive arthritis, and we know that it's a cause of reactive arthritis. Chlamydia trachomatis is a leading cause of preventable blindness worldwide. It has become clear that even some chronic diseases that we didn't think were linked to infectious pathogens now is an infectious pathogen component to them. Uh, chronicity uh, seems to be very different from what we see with acute infections. And we will probably touch on this later, but it seems that the type of bacteria that cause chronic infections are a genetic, dif genetically different types of bacteria from what we see in our acute infections. In other words, we're looking at what we call planktonic bacteria as opposed to bacteria that are found, formed in biofilms. One of the other things that we're seeing with chronic diseases is that they're mostly caused by poly polymicrobial agents. In other words, it's not just one bacterium that is causing these chronic uh, infections. You could have two or three or 10 uh, bacterial uh, organisms or probably viruses and fungi that are involved in, in chronic uh, diseases. And so essentially what you're looking at is that if an individual has an infectious organism in their blood or in their body, in their tissues, in any part, and over time they're not able to clear it, it clearly means that this pathogen has found a way to evade the immune system. And that's really what chronicity is. That over time, whatever the infectious agent is, it has been able to uh, outsmart the immune system, um, outdo the immune system in some way, so that over time, one develops a set of infectious bacteria that live in certain areas, organs, tissues of the body. In an organism like your Lyme disease bug, Borrelia burgdorferi, uh, we have probably hundreds of different forms of Borrelia. And that poses several problems in a chronic disease like Lyme disease. Because you now have to contend with the fact that you might have picked up these different forms at different times over the history of this individual, or you might have gotten several forms at one time. And now, one form might be more susceptible to the antibiotic that one is using to treat this patient than the other forms. And now what you're doing is that you're creating more variants, variants inside of the individuals because the antibiotic is not putting enough pressure on these organisms to cause a bactericidal event. It's chlamydia pneumonia, which is inhaled just like you would in the common cold or, or, or any other uh, cold virus or respiratory viruses. It's picked up through the respiratory tract, but we now know is able to travel throughout the body and go to other areas, including the joints. So both chlamydia trachomatis and chlamydia pneumonia have been found in the joints of, of patients with uh, reactive arthritis. In a mouse model, it was found that when patients, were, were, when mice were infected with chlamydia trachomatis genitally, it took probably about three or four days for these organisms to travel to the joints. We now know that chlamydia trachomatis infections, as well as chlamydia pneumonia infections, result in bone resorption 
In other words, the bone loses density over time. But we also find the organism in the joints, in the synovial membranes, in the synovial fluid itself. Uh, and what that means is that when you have organisms in this very close proximity as the joints, what it does, an infectious organism will now cause the production of cytokines and chemokines. These are chemical messengers that are released by cells in the environment. And this now calls in a lot of, organ a lot of uh, cells, immune cells, T cells, B cells, uh, macrophages possibly, and neutrophils in this very close environment. For chlamydia, it's the lower joints that are normally involved, uh, the joints in the ankles, uh, probably the knees, uh, but typically in the ankles and the foot uh, uh, joints are affected by this. It turns out that it's the persistent forms of the organisms are more dangerous in these types of, 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 of polyarthritic uh, conditions because they're able to sit there for a very long period of time, continue to stimulate the immune system over time, and this condition will continue until the organism is removed. Uh, we can look back uh, in the early 1900s and see where chlamydia trichomyces was found uh, in, the, in the joints of patients and also as, as, as genital uh, infectious diseases. Chlamydia pneumonia is a relatively new pathogen that was discovered uh, in the 60s uh, in Japan uh, and other places. Uh, so we really don't know what the real origin of these organisms are. We now know that they infect a wide uh, uh, plethora of, of, of hosts uh, from animals to humans and we don't know if it came from humans to animals or from animals to humans. When you have a situation where bacteria are treated with antibiotics that can kill them, or when a strong immune system responds to bacteria by producing cytokines or chemokines or other agents that are able to destroy the bacteria and to eliminate them from the body, these bacteria have a choice. They can either stay as an individual bacteria and die, or they can change their form, and instead of being a planktonic bacteria, form biofilms. Biofilms are really a, a consortia of various bacteria coming together in a three-dimensional structure, forming a slime layer around themselves through extra polysaccharides that they secrete, and DNA and other materials from dead or dying bacteria that are in that community. Essentially then what you have is a diverse community of bacteria that are not, probably not related genetically, they're probably not even in the same species, are able to come together and form this community that protects each of the bacteria in the community. And each of these organisms in the community is doing its own thing, producing what it normally produces, but is being protected by the other bacteria uh, that are there. And in chronic diseases and on several uh, uh, devices that are implanted in patients, that is what we're seeing. It is not your individual bacteria like you would normally find on your hands that are causing these, these diseases. And biofilms are found everywhere, from the sludge that you see on, on river stones uh, to uh, water mains, uh, to devices that are used in hospital setting. Everything from uh, catheters, you know, catheters can literally become blocked by biofilm formation. And these biofilms are a composite of bacteria, of viruses, of fungus sometimes, protozoans. Uh, they can all attach and live together in these communities. And what we know about these communities is that they, it takes such a greater concentration of antibiotic to get rid of them that it is not indicated. Uh, you're talking about anywhere from 500 to 5,000 times the concentration that normally is the minimum inhibitory concentration of antibiotic that it takes to kill bacteria in a biofilm. So typically if a biofilm is formed in a prosthetic device, it has to be removed surgically, cleaned or replaced after the, the area is debrided to remove tissues that themselves have biofilms on them. And this is one of the greatest challenges right now to treatment of patients with chronic diseases because chronic infectious diseases are more often biofilm related than they're not. 80 to 90 percent of all of these chronic infections have been confirmed to have some biofilm component there.